some wonder Consider all the works thy hand hath made I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed Then sings my song, my sing God, good Sunday morning. Welcome to the Potter's House. Glad to have you with us. Now let's worship God with all our heart. If you'll please stand to your feet, clap your hands, and sing aloud as we sing, Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Oh, great is your faithfulness. For you never change, and you never fail, oh God. promises, forever to all your promises, for you never change, and you never fail, oh God, so we raise, and so we raise up holy hands, to praise the Holy One, who was, and is, and is to come, so we raise. Can you believe? Oh, can you believe? 
church. I will lift my voice and I'll sing that my God is great and he's greatly to be praised. So bless the Lord. Oh, one more time. God is great. We know that God is God. Give him a shout of praise, church. Man, let's sing this song, this humble song. I'm a friend of God, but who am I that you are mindful of me?
Lift your voice, church. We know it's all because, all because the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, that covers me and raised this dead man's life. Yes, it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. Amen, amen. Alive to give him glory it's said in psalms let everything that has breath praise the lord you got breath in your lungs this morning use it for god amen let's sing this slow song i speak jesus let's take dominion we're declaring the name of jesus that heals saves and delivers we declare it over bullhead city over our families over our fellowship let's sing this song i speak jesus Bad. 
to be absent from the body is present with the Lord you will stand before him one day but right now in faith we believe we're standing before him what would you tell God if you're standing before him 
right now we don't see it we don't see we haven't seen angels and demons we don't we haven't seen the glories of heaven thank god we haven't seen the terrors of hell but you feel the presence of god right now what would you tell him what do you want to tell god i hope in faith you realize that every time you pray you're talking to him you're talking to him again one day your soul will be there and you'll see it with new eyes but right now in faith we believe in faith we're doing things that we don't see yet so we're about to talk to god and i hope you take that uh, uh, uh pretty uh, uh seriously we're going to lift many needs before him a god who hears a god who cares a god who has all power and all eternity but he chose to manifest it in love and even to, in subtle changes and so we're asking god's hand amen we have many needs we're praying uh there's a list and a half so let me get through this, uh, uh, but remember these names. We're praying for Steve Lujan. Uh, went to the hospital last night. We're praying for healing in his body. Amen. David White, recovering from a heart attack. Prayers for healing and good blessing. Lisa, uh, Lisa's sister. Amen. David Lee, Randy Corrigan, John Thompson for salvation. Shane Booker, needs safety and good health. Many blessings. Courtney Tigner, uh, or Courtney Turner. <laughs> for healing that was not a prophecy uh chris fuller <laughs> for healing kevin needs healing in his legs debbie blanchard for healing from an autoimmune disease bill starkey for healing courtney and shelly uh craig uh, uh, greg schlenz linda nathan and cindy debbie myron marie rebecca and elena all for salvation conrad senior amber hauser salvation michelle and indy amen turning it over i haven't done that for a while Ron and Pam Rice, amen, need healing. Brenda Landers needs healing. David Nowak for salvation. Virginia Nowak for healing. Deborah Moran for healing. And Carol Brown, healing in her eyes. Jay's parents, Matt and Sue Ann for salvation. Amen. You wrote on this list because we believe God. These aren't wasted words. This isn't a wasted list. This isn't a diary to nowhere. Your prayers are not words to nowhere. We're going to send our prayers in faith to God. And you ever made an airplane, a, a, a paper airplane? If you didn't make it right, it's going to flop to the ground. Realize what makes your prayers fly is faith. Faith pleases God. Faith, God, you are going to move. You know these names. You know these people. In faith, let's ask God continued help in Nassau, our baby missionary work. Amen. Let's also ask God's help in Conway, South Carolina, Myrtle Beach. Amen. Let's also remember Sholo, Pine Top, Denton, Euless. Amen. Many of our pastors that you see their faces when you walk down the hall. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Lift your voices with me. And then this morning, I want to ask if Mr. Dave Fowles would open us in prayer. Church, pray in faith. God, we Amen. Amen. Good Sunday morning. So glad to have you and your families. Welcome to the Potter's House. Turn and greet one another.
Let's declare it together. I am. I am, I am a believer. I am, I am a believer. I am, I am a believer in him. He's the lion. For he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the God of Abraham. He is my father. He is the great I am. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the God of Abraham. And he is my father. He is the great I am. Amen. We remember these names of God, self-sufficient, providing for himself and providing for all life. Amen. He didn't need us. He is the great I am, but it's his blessing that he gave us life. What a wonderful thing it is. Listen, without God, I don't think life is a blessing. Outside of God, sin and yeah, pleasures for a moment, but the long-term effects of sin, your life slowly falls apart. The things you enjoyed in your youth, you, you lose, and sin takes and takes and takes, but God still gives and gives and gives. I mean, I was just working with uh, Braulio at my parents' house, helping me run a, a, a cable for a new light, and it's amazing. We don't know where it comes from. You just flip a switch, and there's the power, right? Somewhere, there's power plants that are constantly churning and turning, whether it uses water or air or magnet, magnesis or magic, however it happens. I know that there's going to be power because something gives and gives. Do you realize Amen. You're plugged into God. He always gives and gives and gives. That is such a wonderful blessing. And I'm glad that you're here and we're here in church because God gave us another chance. Some of us were on our 3,000th chance. Amen. But God gives by his mercy. Amen. Welcome to the Potter's House again. Amen. If you are just visiting us or you've just joined us recently, we are honored to have you. We're here for you and because of you. Amen. This is what Jesus has done. He came from heaven, an ambassador, to show us and to give us with his own blood the grace of God. And so we are still continuing in that, that you would know God has grace sufficient for you. A few announcements, if you'll please get involved with us, especially I want to tell our men. Tomorrow we have a, a, a men's discipleship class. This is in Las Vegas. It's not a monster road trip. Amen. It's just a couple hours down the road. But Pastor Scott Lamb is hosting this, and Pastor Paul Stevens will be ministering. Amen. This is a leadership church, a conference church. Uh, Pastor Paul Stevens pastors in El Paso, Texas. Amen. It was a, a powerful, wonderful work of God. He's planted, uh, I don't even know, dozens of pastors. They have many, many churches around the world. And so we want to go and hear the gospel. Remember, this is... This is our, our, our drive. I, I pray that each of you want to progress. Each of you want to get further. Uh, if there is no growth, you know what that's called? That's called stagnation. And things that are stagnant die and rot. And so we need to progress. So men, we call you to come to this men's discipleship class. And so I actually want to take a, 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 a count. And if you'll put your hands up if you're going to the class because... Our church van is in the shop right now, so we have to figure out multiple vehicles and, and how to go. So every man, you want to go to the men's discipleship, would you please lift your hand? Amen. It's about eight, nine, ten. All right, so probably two, three vehicles. Amen. Anyone willing to drive your own vehicle? I'll be taking a van and Mark. Okay, so between me and Mark, and if we overflow, we'll talk to David. So men, if you want to go... Let's fill up our van, Mark's car, and David as well. Praise God. Amen. Excellent, men. And then our next announcement, we are going to be uh, uh, blessing our baby church in Henderson with an impact team. This is April 27th. Glory to God. It's going to be a good time. I really do enjoy uh, uh, traveling with you all. I enjoy the conversations that happen, but more than anything, that God could use us. Who am I that God would use me? Amen. So uh, the impact team list is on the back wall. Please get your name on it today. Get your name on that list so we know how many are coming. And by then, the van will be out of the shop, and we will be ready to rock. We're going to be sending impact team and bands. We're going to do a concert for Henderson, and so it's going to be a blast. We're looking forward to that. Praise God. Remember, newcomers class on Thursday, women's lunch crunch every weekday at 12. You can come here for prayer meeting. 
And uh, honestly, I've heard stories of, of special things ladies have done in other churches calling spur-of-the-moment outreaches, and, and it released revival. I think a lot of what we're experiencing with God helping us is extra prayer, extra prayer of the saints. So thank you, ladies. More ladies, please come and join these for prayer. Our church is open at 6. We'll make sure that it's open. I know it's we've missed it a couple times. Some haven't been opening. You need to open it, whoever opens it. Amen, and it'll be open at 6. Amen. If we could have the ushers come on forward. Come on forward, and we're going to take an offering in the house of God. Through my life in this church, which you'll remember, I was born in 1987. That's the year my dad took over this church here in Bullhead. And all my life, you know, a little kid sleeping under the roads, whatever the progression is, uh, you guys have watched me progress, and thank God there has been progress. Uh, but all my life, one other thing that I've watched is the changing of our offering buckets through the years. Do you guys remember the old metal plates with the red cloth center? And then there was a time we were using KFC buckets in the school when we were in Coyote Canyon before we got in here. Someone finally painted the KFC buckets. They were just glorious. And now we have these, you know, Hecho in Mexico, you know, whatever they are. <laughs> but think about it. The Bible talks about treasure in earthen vessels, and it's not necessarily talking about our offering. Again, it's talking about an offering God gave us. It's perfect that we sing the song, Who am I that you are mindful of me? Who in the world are we that God's very spirit wants to dwell with inside of us? Here you are, you're going to put your hard-earned money into a bucket, probably not made in our country. It doesn't matter you know, so much the vessel. God uses the unlikely. The Bible says not many wise, not many strong. This, this is so that God gets the glory. He uses people like you and me. And you bet, some might work at KFC. Your tithe might be coming from KFC. <laughs> McDonald's, Walmart. Then we have others, you know, they bear their work on their hands, gnarled knuckles and, and handshakes of leather and, and ox strength. And we use our abilities and this body, this body to give God glory. Like these offering buckets. What are they special? But we're about to put something special in them. And remember that. What is my body? It was nothing until the Spirit of God breathed into dirt. To dirt we return. So what is our life? If you'll remember, if you'll think about it honestly, your life is God. God is life, His breath, His giving. And so now, will you honor Him with your life? Will you honor Him with your vessel? And you'll put your tithes and your offerings inside these buckets, and it goes to the glory of heaven. Amen. Let's bow our heads as uh, uh, Mr. Mark Marshall, please pray over gift and giver. Amen. Alive, alive. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive. Alive forevermore. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Cause my Jesus is alive forevermore. Sing Turn with me in your Bibles, please, this morning. Hebrews uh, chapter 13, if you would. Hebrews chapter number 13. Thank you all to our platform workers for all your help. It's always uh, a bit difficult, you know, uh, trying to find the mind of God. You know, after such good revivals, we had just 
finishing up with our brother Alvin. Uh, I believe, what is that? That's our second revival of the year. And so we started out, you remember how many, we had Rick Martinez here, first revival of the year, and then uh, with uh, uh, Pastor Alvin. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's amazing, you know, because the same word of God comes out of their mouth but just different personalities, and that's exactly what preaching is. It's, it's, it's God using different vessels. It's the same word, but it comes through different personalities, and so just a wonderful uh, revival. Not only that, two back-to-back great revivals that we've had, and so, uh, amen. I want to uh, bring you uh, something on my heart this morning uh, out of the book of Hebrews in chapter number 13. Uh, it was in one of the darkest hours of our nation. You know, it was called the American War, the mid-1800s. Uh, went on, you know it more, it's more familiar by the term the Civil War. But if you can imagine America going to war against America, you know, that's what that Civil War was. It was the North and the South, and there was uh, horrible issues numbers of issues that, that, that brought division in our own country. And uh, in one of, the, one of the greatest political presidential speeches, uh, Abraham Lincoln, president of the time, what he did is he addressed our nation and he spoke those words that, uh, that, that perhaps we all remember. And what he did is he, as he, as he you know, addressed America torn in two, what he did is he quoted literally the words of Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, a, a nation, a house divided against itself cannot stand. You do understand that those very words affect your house. Those very words affect uh, your family, your marriage and relationships. And I wonder, as I look over this great congregation, you know, how many of you, those words can be spoken of your house? That your house is divided. Your, your family, your marriage is divided. I came across this illustration. I thought it was real interesting. And if I could read it, it said, There came a time in the, in the Old West when cattlemen began fencing off their ranches. Barbed wire was used to mark the boundaries. The wire let everyone know whose land was whose and which cattle belonged to which ranch. The barbed wire kept cattle in and it also kept the stranger and the rustler out. One author suggested that every family goes through a time of putting up barbed wire. We define our boundaries today as a family unit. But what happens when the barbed wire is taken down and moved inside the house and restrung down the center of the living room? And then he went on to quote those words, a house divided. Barbed wire on your house, in your house, one side, the other side. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I want to look at a, at a memorable, memorable, memorable portion of Scripture. I want to talk to you tonight about marriage. And I know that not all of you are, are married, uh, and this is words for your hope chest. These are words for one day. These words need to mark your life. If you are in the process of getting married, or you are married, or you want to be married, please listen to these words. I want to talk to you tonight. The title of my sermon is Honorable in All. One verse of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. If we have that Scripture up, I'd like to do what Pastor Alvin did. I'd like to just read it together. One verse of scripture, read it with me. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. 
but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Father, I'm asking you, God, for your continued hand of grace upon our families, upon our marriages, and upon our homes, Lord. God, we need you at work in our churches, but God, in our homes, we have to have you at work in our homes, in our families. God, help us. Strengthen us by your word this morning. We give you praise in Jesus' name. I want to talk to you something, uh, first of all, about something that I've seen very unique about marriage. And, and I didn't learn this in, the book, in a book. I learned it from watching people and primarily from watching young couples get married. And that is the fact how marriage matures you. Marriage causes you to grow and to develop. And that's my first thought is marriage and maturity. And so what we have is we have, you know, one simple verse of Scripture. That's all we read. But what we're going to do this morning is we're going to break it down in three different thoughts, three separate thoughts. And the first thought that I want you to, you know, uh, uh, underline in your, in your mind's eye is that statement that the Bible makes about marriage. The Bible says it's honorable in all. And so I don't know what kind of a marriage you come from. I don't know what kind of family you come from. You know, I don't know stable families, divorce. I don't know, but, but I do know what the Bible says about marriage. And as Christians, what we're called to do is to align ourselves with what the Word of God says about marriage. And so this is a, this is a, uh, a defining statement about marriage. And God says marriage is what? It's honorable in all. Other translations, you know, as you, as you uh, begin to grow a little bit, you find that there are other translations of the Bible. Uh, uh, you know, primarily what we have is we have the King James Version Bible. But there is uh, numerous other different versions, and all they do is they say the same thing, but they say it, you know, in different words you know, painting a fuller picture, bringing you a better understanding of the Word of God. And so other translations of that scripture that says marriage is honorable in all, one man's, uh, one translation said, let marriage be held in honor. Another translation, marriage should be honored. The third, marriage is honorable. The fourth, honor your marriage and then the fifth translation is marriage in every way should be honored. So this is what the Bible says about marriage, but it's not necessarily what we see in our world today. I mean, it's vastly different what, how our world views marriage today. And you don't have to look very far around you or even in your own family to see this principle of marriage being honorable, this truth is crumbling all around you, all around you. He was a senior White House advisor, and what he did is he taught at George Washington University, and what he really did is, is I believe that he really did, he had a, he had a heart for, for the families of America. And so what he did is he wrote a book, and, and one of the themes that he dealt with in that book is, is the theme was the American ego-centered mentality, the American ego-centered me mentality. And I want to I wanna bring you just a couple of his quotes, but what, because what he was concerned about is, is, is marriage. He was, he's concerned about the health of the home and of the family, and some of his quotes are, he found that 17% that of Americans are committed to a hardcore, self-centered philosophy. He went on to say, at least 80% of Americans are in the process of buying into a self-centered mentality. And then he said this, he said, he said the desire for self-fulfillment is coming in America to supersede and take priority over work, family, spouses, and children. In the age of ego, marriage is often less than an emotional bonding 
than a breakable alliance between self-seeking individuals. And so, I, you know, I'm not the shar sharpest tool in the shed. And a lot of times when I read a, a quote that captures my imagination, I've got to read it a couple of times so I can understand what it is that he's trying to say. And this writer is saying that in the age of, of ego in America today, he says marriage is not a bonding of two individual peoples together, but a breakable alliance between two selfish individuals. And so I thought that that was worthy, worthy of our attention. Uh, recently in our church, we've had uh, numbers of, of new converts, young and old, that have come into the church. They have genuinely given their hearts to Jesus Christ. And as they started coming to church, very quickly they begin to understand some things about God. They begin to understand some things about, about this holy book. They begin to understand, you know, the sanctity of marriage, the holiness, or, or, or primarily how God sees marriage. And so as they come in and, you know, maybe, you know, they were living together before they got saved, they come in, they begin to hear preaching about marriage, they begin to hear truths about the Word of God, and because of that, what they decide to do, they want to have a church wedding. They don't want to go to Las Vegas, they don't want to go to the Justice of the Peace, you know, and have him officiate over their wedding. And so what they want to do is they want to get married in the house of God. And in the house of God, what they do is they invite family, they invite their friends, but primarily the reason that a couple wants to get married in a church service is because, it's because the Word of God has taken on new meaning in their life. And not only the Word of God has taken on new meaning, but your vows. I want you to look around. How many of you, when you got married, you spoke vows? Raise your hand. Look around. Look around. Because that's what they did when they got married, young and old. Marriage is, is you are speaking, yes, vows to each other, but what you're doing is you're speaking to your vows to God. And that's why, that's why you know, the, you know they want to have a church wedding. New converts want to have a church wedding because they understand that the vows that they are about to speak what they are, they're speaking their vows in the very presence of God. And one of those vows that takes on, that should take on brand new meaning in your life as a Christian man or as a Christian woman, a vow that should shake you to your core is when you said, until death do us part. How many of you said that? Raise your hand. All over this building. You said that, until death do us part. That vow before God determines where your, vow, your marriage is going to be 25 years down the road. That vow you made, you know, in the eyes of God, I know it was lovey-dovey when you got married, but there's going to come times in your marriage where it's not lovey-dovey. And those vows that you made, what they do is they secure your marriage 30 years down the road, 40 years down the road. And when you speak those vows, you stand here before the congregation and you speak that vows. Literally, literally what you're saying is, is we don't care what society says about marriage. We don't care what the world says about marriage. What you're saying is, we understand that in the eyes of God, Marriage is for life. And so if you can't, if you don't understand that, please don't ask me to marry you. Don't ask me to marry you. Go, let Elvis marry you. Go to Vegas, Little White Chapel. Let, but what you understand, you're saying in the eyes of God, I understand, Lord, marriage is for life. Listen to what George Barna said. He this is a man that was made famous, you know, by, by looking at our society, looking at our American culture, and, and by our actions, he would, he would say very wise things. But he said this 
20 years ago. He said by the year 2005, we're not 2005, but he said by the year 2005, the average adult will have had three different marriage partners by the year 2005. Can you say a house divided against itself cannot stand? Two stories. A sixth grade teacher in an upper middle class California city asked her class of 30 to complete a creative writing assignment by finishing a sentence that began with the words, I wish. The teacher expected the children to respond for wishes, for bicycles, dogs, TV sets, trips to Hawaii. She couldn't have been more wrong. A full 20 of the 30 children made references in their response to their own disintegrating families. Here are a few examples. I wish my parents wouldn't fight, and I wish my dad would come back. Another said, I wish my mother didn't have a boyfriend. Another said, I wished I could get straight A's so my father would love me. Another one said, I wish I had one mom and one dad so the kids wouldn't make fun of me. I have three moms and three dads, and they confuse my life. And then finally, the last one said, I wished I had an M1 rifle so I could shoot those who make fun of me. A house divided against itself. A little nine-year-old girl said, I don't know exactly what a family is, but I do know one thing. Your friends can go off and say they don't want to be your friends anymore, but people just can't go off and say they don't want to be your family. And I wish that was true. And nothing, nothing is sadder to see in life than a house divided against it. Back to our text this morning, God's definition of marriage. What God is teaching us this morning is young and old, is that marriage in every way should be held in honor. And, you know, in contrast to our society's definition of marriage today, I read it to you. What's, what, uh, you know, this writer says, Apparently, marriage today is a breakable alliance between two self-centered individuals. Anybody in here, you read any of Louis L'Amour? Anybody read any of the old Louis L'Amour books? I know, I know Jeff does. And uh, he wrote a book. The, the book is called To the Far Blue Mountains. And in that book, a man asks, a woman to marry him. And then the man chuckled a little bit. He kind of laughed under his breath, to which the woman kind of, she said, why, why are you laughing? Isn't marriage serious? And what he did is he responded with one of the most classic definitions of marriage that I think you'll ever come across. He says, of course I think marriage is serious. Marriage is the ultimate test of maturity, and many find excuses for avoiding it because they know they're not up to the challenge. They know they're not carry, capable of carrying on a mature relationship. And so that's one of the things that I look for, you know, when I, when I am involved in, in marrying a young couple. There, there has to be, there has to be a... a a depth of maturity. Do you know what maturity is? <clears throat> Do you understand by definition what maturity is? A very good definition of maturity is simply this, is an understanding that you live for others. Maturity. Growing up. It's not about you anymore. Maturity is understanding there are other people involved other than me. And, and with that being said, you know, the same can also be said, a selfish 
person, a selfish man or a selfish woman, by very definition, immaturity, immaturity. And we're raising in our generation today a generation of young, selfish, immature people whose only care in life is me, 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 taking care of me. And then the danger is you grow up, get married, and you carry that into your marriage. You carry that in your home and in your hands. I'm telling you, two immature people that only care for themselves, in your hands, marriage is going to become as breakable as, as, as fragile China. There's nothing worse than a selfish, self-serving husband who's always right. You dominating little pharaoh, you. Anybody old enough to remember the TV program All in the Family? Anybody remember? One day Edith is talking to her friend Amelia about marriage. Amelia tells Edith, she says, of all the people I know, Edith, you're practically the only one that has a happy marriage. Edith says, oh, really? Me and Archie? Thank you so much. Then Amelia said, Edith, what's your secret? And Edith said, this is a secret to my marriage. Oh, I ain't got no secret. Archie and me, we still have our fights. Of course, we don't let them go on, to lo- go on too long. Somebody always says, I'm sorry. And Archie always says, it's okay, Edith. <laughs> I repeat... Nothing worse than a selfish, self-serving husband who is always right. Ephesians 5.25 is a shocker when you read it for the very first time. When you understand the depth of what it's saying. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And Paul, under inspiration, I mean, I can see the Apostle Paul right now, maybe working under a lantern, you know. And he's writing out the words that we know today is Holy Scripture. And Paul is moved on by the Spirit of God. And he's writing to husbands. And he says, if you want your marriage to work, give yourself to your wife as Jesus gave himself to the church. How many of you know we have laws that say children cannot get married? Do you ever think about that? Children can't get married. Why do you suppose we have those laws? That children can't get married. Because children are selfish. They're, they're, they're self-centered. Children, it's, they, they take and they take and they take. So somebody tell me, what is supposed to happen when you turn 18? You start shaving? What happens when you turn 18? What happens when you turn 19? You're supposed to become mature. And every one of us in this building, if you've lived life for any period of time, you've learned something about maturity. Maturity is not an age. It's not an age. I've met people 50 years old. They are lacking in maturity. And so maturity is not, you know, I, how many of you uh, don't raise your hand? I can't wait till I turn 18. I'm counting the days. Maturity is not an age. It's a decision a decision I choose great prayer at the altar I choose to grow up I choose to be a man I choose to be a woman that's Bible that's what Paul says 1 Corinthians 13 11 when I was a child I spoke as a child I understood as a child 
I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And what he's doing is he's given us a beautiful picture of what growth and maturity and development is all about. Paul says, one day, it wasn't my quinceanera. It wasn't my bar mitzvah. It wasn't, you know, when I hit 21, 19, 18, one day I made the choice. One day I made the decision to grow up, to become a man. And that really does give us insight into how maturity is formed. It's not an age. What it is, it's a mentality. It's a choice of your mind. And with that in mind, with that, and we say, why, why are you saying all that? Because I'm talking about the greatest. Do you know what the greatest enemy to a marriage is? You want to know what the greatest enemy always knocking at your door, always trying to get it in your house, in your home, in your marriage? Selfishness. Me, 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 me. Selfishness. God never designed for two selfish people to be married. It can't be. It can't be. Why do you suppose marriage is so important? Ultimately, marriage cannot survive, will not survive, when, when the family breaks down. I want to look at the second part. I want to look at the second part of that scripture. Again, like I said, it's one verse of scripture but just three separate little thoughts in that scripture. The second thought that God says about marriage, family, the home, is, is the bed is to be undefiled. Your bed. And so if I've, if I've ever prayed through your house, if you've ever asked me or Pastor Jonathan to pray through your house, you know, and, and we do this, and we believe this, you know, we just welcome in the presence of God, we worship God, and I mean, you buy a new, come into a new apartment, you, you don't know what was in that apartment before you got there. You have no idea what happened there. And so, but one of the things that I will always do, you know, if I go in, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be nosy, I'm looking for stuff. I mean, when I go in your home, you know, I'm looking for things you shouldn't have, maybe you ought to get rid of. But I always take special time to pray over the marriage bed. I always, I, this is a master bedroom. This is where you sleep. I lay hands on that bed. And because of the truth of that, it's, it's simply that. It's the bed. The bed is to be undefiled. How many believe that? Raise your hand. Come on. The bed is to be undefiled. And so that is the second part of that text that we read this morning is that the marriage bed is to be kept pure. There is an <coughs> interesting figure in most paintings of kings and queens and princes during the Renaissance time, during the resident, Renaissance period. Uh, 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 Catherine the Great uh, 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 married to uh, King Louis, I don't know, the 15th, 14th, but it's interesting, and, and you can even do your research for yourself, but, but a lot of times in these Renaissance pictures, they would, she, she, had, she ordered up these paintings to be done, but in a lot of the Renaissance pictures, you know, there's always a dog in the picture. There's always a dog. But, but in this particular portrait that she had drawn up of her and King Louis, what she did, two things were obvious in this portrait and that were, those were dogs and, and, and the rings of royalty. And so rings, you know, as, as many of you possibly already understand, that rings in the Word of God, it's a, it's, it's a symbol of, a ring is a symbol of power. It's a symbol of authority and dominion. But also in these portraits, there's, there's pictures of dogs. And why dogs? This was very interesting to me is a lot of the pictures, these early pictures had dogs in them because dogs were a symbol of fidelity. They were a symbol of loyalty. They were a symbol of, of faithfulness, you know, man's best friend. I can remember as a kid growing up, you know, anybody ever remember that old black and white movie called The Incredible Journey? 
Anybody remember ever seeing that movie? It's just an old, old classic. And all it's about, it's, it's about a dog traveling uh, a, a, an incredible day. The dog got separated from its master, and the dog just traveling this incredible distance to be reunited with his master. And so that is a picture. That's a reason dogs in these Renaissance portraits, they're, they're a symbol of faithfulness and fidelity and loyalty. And, you know, some marriages, a, a different kind of dog describes your marriage. At the height of the arms race, the Americans and Russians realized that if they continued in the usual manner, they were going to blow up the whole world. One day they sat down and decided to settle the whole dispute with one dogfight. They'd have five years to breed the best fighting dog in the world, and whichever dogs, whichever side's dog won would be entitled to dominate the world. The losing side would have to lay down its arms. The Russians found the biggest, meanest Doberman and Rottweiler in the world and bred them with the biggest, meanest Siberian wolves. They selected only the biggest and strongest puppy from each litter, uh, killed his siblings, and gave him all the milk. They used steroids and trainers. And after five years, the Russians came up with the biggest, meanest dog the world had ever seen. Its cage needed steel bars that were five inches thick, and nobody could get near it. So when the day came for the actual dog fight, the Americans showed up with a strange-looking animal. It was a nine-foot-long dachshund. Everyone felt sorry for the Americans because they knew there was no way that this dog could possibly last 10 seconds with the Russian dog. When the cages were open, the dachshund slowly waddled over to the Russian dog. The Russian dog snarled and charged the American dachshund, but when he got close enough to bite the dachshund's neck, the dachshund opened its mouth and consumed the Russian dog in one bite. There was nothing left at all of the Russian dog. The Russians came to the Americans shaking their heads in disbelief. We don't understand. How could this have happened? We had our best people working for five years with the meanest dogs and wolves in the world. That's nothing, an American replied. We had our best plastic surgeons working for five years to make that alligator look like a dachshund. Three times in the Bible, we find this statement, the husband of one wife. The husband of one wife. You've heard the saying before, you know, a one-man dog, that some dogs are one-man dogs. You know, some people say, you know, about particular breeds, you know, uh, particular breeds, they said that these kind of dogs, they don't, they don't have the temperament to be a good family dog, you know, because these breeds, they kind of have anger issues. You know, but there's one thing about some of these breeds is that they are one-man dogs. In other words, there's one man, one voice they listen to, one man they respond to. And I want to say that's what marriage is in the eyes of God. When you get married, you're to be a one-woman man. You're to be a one-man woman. How many agree with that? How many said that's good preaching this morning? One man, woman. One woman, man. That's what marriage is in the eyes of God when you say your vow. Loyalty, fidelity, faithfulness. And what you need to be able to do is like a magnifying glass. What you need to do is centralize and focus your love on one woman. One man. What's 1 Corinthians 13? 
love chapter. The love chapter in the Bible. And you know, it's always been a, such a revelation to me. All those words in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the great love chapter of the Bible. All those verses that we talk, that the Bible talks about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not easily provoked. Love seeks not her own. But the point I want to make is all those words are verbs. They're verbs. Is there any proud graduate of Mojave High School that could tell us what a verb is? What's a verb? Action word. A verb is an action word. And to a young generation that's captivated by fuzzies and feelings and emotions, love is an action. And I want to counter that, you know, and, and, and thank God, I believe in romance, and there should be romance, but, but love according to the Word of God, it's not feelings and emotions. You know, Americans, we're, we're in love with feelings and emotions. And, 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 and what we've done is we've confused, you know, Bible love with romantic love. Romantic love, you know, it, it focuses on mascara and mouthwash and slim figures and padded bras and big muscles. No, love operates without those things. Without those. I heard a great definition of love. Real love is a skill that's rarely mastered before the age of 35. Let me say that again. Real love is a skill that's rarely mastered before the age of 35. Because those who have been married for any period of time in this building, you know that love is not, real love is not an emotion, it's not an attraction, it's not a feeling. Real love is something that you do. It's an action that you show. And for those of you that maybe your, your love needle is running dangerously low, do something. Do something for that person you're married. Take action. Do something. A woman came for counseling in our marriage, <coughs> full of <coughs> hatred. She said, I'm getting a divorce. I'm tired of my husband. I want him out. I want to get rid of him. I, but I want, I want to get even with him before I divorce him. I want to hurt him as much as I can to get even because of what he's done for me, to me. Counselor said, I have a plan. This is what you can do. Go home, act as if you really love him, care for him, and admire him. Praise all his good qualities. Lift him up as much as possible. Go out of your way to please him and take care of him. Do everything you could think of to make him believe you really do love him, and then drop the bomb. Tell him you hate him, you despise him, and that you're divorcing him. With revenge in her eyes, the woman smiled and said, what a wonderful, what a beautiful man. And so for three months, she acted as if she really did love him, did everything possible she could do, listened to him, took care of him, cooked for him, loved him, praised him. And then the counselor noticed for three months he hadn't heard a peep from this woman. He gave her a call, and he says, man, I've, I've heard nothing from you. Are you still getting that divorce? And she says, divorce? Oh, no, no, no. I've discovered after these last three months that I really do love him. And the moral to that story is love is an action. Love is something that you do. The Bible never teaches have feelings, and then love will come. The Bible teaches, the Bible teaches, do something. Take action, and your actions stir up the emotions. That's good doctrine. 
And this woman, what she did is she activated love by her action. She started doing, she started doing, she started doing. And again, the greatest, the greatest chapter on love in the Bible, and it's descriptive of things you do, not feelings and emotions. You know, do, be, be patient, be kind, be tenderhearted, do all of these things, take action, and then the feelings. Text mentions two things that will contaminate your marriage bed. You want to detonate your house? You want to detonate your family? You want to contaminate it nuclear red. The Bible uses the words, whoremongers and adulterers. Another translation says fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And this is why we take, a, take such a sta strong stance in our fellowship against sexual immorality. God says two things will detonate your house. Adultery and fornication. What does our society bombard us with on every side? On every, from, from movies to TV to magazines to billboards. I mean, you, you can't hardly, you can't hardly, you know, go on the internet that somewhere an ad and, 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 and the word sex doesn't appear on the cover. And advertising today, it's like they're not even, they're not selling clothing. They're not selling perfume. What are they selling? They're selling these strong, young, fit bodies. And the difficulty for a man or a woman of God in our day and age is it's the difficulty of staying clean, staying pure in an impure society. You know how affairs begin? You know how affairs begin in the church? You know how they begin? I, I read a quote. It said, no good Christian man or woman gets up in the morning, looks out the window and says, my, what a lovely day. I guess I'll go out and commit adultery. How do affairs begin? Even in the house of God, how do they begin? Is it because they're sexually attracted to someone else? I got to tell you, you know, I've had a real revelation, you know, about adultery and, and affairs. And they don't begin, you know, because a, because a man sees a beautiful woman or a woman is, you know, sees, a, a, you know, two moths drawn with each other like a flame. Affairs oftentimes begin because they're not happy at home. They're not, they're not loved at home. They're not valued. They're not appreciated at home. And it just, it just you can see the chemistry. As they just meet somebody, and they value them. And they, and they begin to speak nice to them, and kind to them, and loving to them. And that's how affairs get started. The sex follows. Many affairs are not about the sex. And, and remember, and please, with that in mind, remember, I just want to tell you, it's possible to have affairs in church without sex. Just a mental. You're married, but you're drawn to someone else, and the reason you like being around them is because of how they talk to you, how they, how they make you feel. And I want to tell you, if you'll build a good relationship in your house, if you'll build a happy relationship in your home, you won't have to worry about your spouse going out on you. Anybody here, you want to affair-proof your marriage? You want to affair-proof your marriage? Start one with your spouse. That's close. Talk about the judgment of God. I said she didn't smile when I say that. <coughs> but that's the third thought. God will judge. 
So this is, this is God's. I, marriage is honorable. Now that you're saved, come into church, regardless what you come out of. Marriage is honorable. You to give eye honor to your marriage. The second thought, you know, we see this clearly in the Word of God. You know, the bed is to be pure. It's to be undefiled. And then the third thought is just simply it's fornicators and adulteries, adulterers God will judge. And so no society can withstand the breakdown of the marriage. And that's kind of what I want to go to in our country today. No society can withstand the breakdown of the family. When, when the family goes, for the country to go, the country follows our families. The country follows our homes and our marriages. When our homes and marriages break down, you can kiss America goodbye. You can kiss it goodbye. And so when we think of the judgment of God, you know, that's the last three words we read there. God will judge. And, you know, when we think about the judgment of God, you know, I don't know what, close your eyes, you think of the judgment of God, I don't know what you think of lightning bolts, I don't know if you think of these hailstones falling from the sky, you know, we think of fire and brimstone, but let me remind you, you know, coming to the judgment of God is, is, is none of this. Common to the judgment of God. Many times when God, when God judges, this is what God does. He takes his hand off your life. Did you hear the preacher this morning? He takes his hand off your life. And when God takes his hand, when God takes his hand off your life, your home, your marriage, your family, your city, what happens when God takes his hand off? We rot from the inside. I close. Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And then it goes on to describe the actual judgment of God. In verse 24. Therefore, because they're rebellious, because they don't want to live for God. Listen to what God says. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Because of this, God gave them, gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relationships for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. And all that I want you to see there is the Bible's describing the judgment of God. God says the judgment of God is it's not lightning bolts. It's not the earth opening up and swallowing people's lives. God says, I'm just going to remove my hand from your life, and I'm going to give you over to your own sinful desires. I'm going to give you over to your own sexual desires, your own shameful lust. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, you want to know what part of my judgment involves? It literally means that when I, I just I take my hand off you. My presence is removed from your life, and I'm just going to give you over to your own depraved mind, your own sexual impurity. Now you're going to be doing things with men you shouldn't be doing. Women doing things with women they shouldn't be. Are we seeing this in America today? God says, that's my judgment. That's my wrath being poured out on you. 
I just take my hand off your life and you do whatever you want. Another part of the judgment of God, and I close with this, is just the inability to see God. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In closing, you know what you lose when your heart's dirty? When your heart's full of lust, when your heart's full of sexual sin, you lose the ability to see God. Anybody here, you want to see God? Our society is so permeated by lust, fornication, adultery, they couldn't see God even if they wanted to. And the greatest reason for you and I to live clean and to keep your heart pure is not, you know, so I, I, I don't want to go to hell, I don't want to go to hell. But the, rest, the best reason for you to live clean is so you can see God. So you can see Jesus. Do you want to see Jesus? Then keep your heart clean. Keep your heart pure. Let's bow our heads. <coughs> heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Honorable and all. Honorable and all. I'm, I'm so moved by uh, Pastor Greg's Sunday school. It's great to be able to receive. Normally, I teach Sunday school. It's great to be able to sit back and receive. And we're being refreshed from the, the history and the, and the origins of our, of our fellowship. And what we're doing is we're uncovering, we're just trying to blow the dust off an ancient principle in the Word of God concerning marriage. And maybe, maybe you're in a good marriage. Maybe you're not. Maybe you were raised as a child in a good marriage. Maybe you were not. But the issue this morning is to begin to see marriage, how God sees marriage, how the Bible states marriage. And this morning we brought out three concise, three distinct little thoughts about what God says about marriage and the home and the family. And I want you to, this morning, start seeing marriage in the eyes of God. You can't give, you can't give over to your thoughts and your ideas and your feelings and your emotions. And can you be stirred again our topic this morning is honorable in all. These are the words of God that are to permeate, to sound off in our, in our ears and in our minds. And I want to change the order of the service. Perhaps here you're, you're visiting with us. It's always wonderful when I see in a, any given church service, I see people I've never seen before they come into the house of God and what we do here is we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ the primary message that Jesus came preaching is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand the, the primary reason that, that Jesus existed and took on the form of a man as Jesus says, I come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's you this morning. That's you. You're a visitor, young, old, mom, dad. That without Christ, without, without salvation, the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart, the Bible describes you as you are lost. You could be rich and lost. You can be attractive and lost. You could be highly, highly educated and lost. The issue, none of it matters because at the end of the day, you are lost. And this is why we preach, Jesus is for you. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer for your home, your marriage, but he's the answer for your sin. He's the antidote. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. God's speaking to hearts. You're here. You're far from God. 
Actually, in all reality, you are the God of your life. It's your choices and your decisions that determine what you do and where you go in life. You're the God of your life. And Jesus says, I, I want to lead you. I, I want to forgive you. If there's anyone you want to receive that, I want you to raise your hand right now. Pastor, I'm not saved. I want forgiveness of my sin. Here's my hand. Hold it up, please. Don't be ashamed. Lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. I'm flashing back uh, years ago, decades ago. That's what I did in a church service. I raised my hand, came in. I was not right with God. I felt the conviction of God. The preacher said, you want to get right? You want to raise your hand. And my hand shot up. Listen, you're not right with God. Open your heart to Jesus this morning. Let him save you. Anyone unsaved, backslidden, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. All right, I'm take, talking to all different kinds of people. I'm talking to married folks. I'm talking to soon-to-be married folks. I'm talking to young people that one day it's your heart desire. And these are some principles that lead us and guide us and direct us. And what you need to do is you need to come. You need to understand marriage is for the, is for the mature. It's not for self. You, you can't, your marriage can't be built on selfishness. You've got to understand some things about, about marriage. It's an action. It's an act. The feelings, if you want the feelings to come back, then take an action. Do something. Do something. Let's stand to our feet. Our altars are open. Please come and make contact with God this morning. Get real. Talk to God about your home. Talk to Him about your heart, your mindset. And allow God to have right of way in your midst this morning. Regardless of the circumstances of life, Lord, we see from your lens, Lord, from your truth and your word. God, I set my will to be obedient. I set my will to serve you, Lord. God, deliver me, I pray. Help us, Lord. God, taking dominion over selfishness and ego. Oh, God, help us. God, give us a burden for our spouse. Give us a burden for our family, our home, and our marriage, I pray. God, I'm asking you, let revival begin in our own homes, God. Revive our marriages, I pray. God, breathe life. Breathe resurrection power upon our homes upon our families, upon our marriages, oh God. Let our homes be a testimony. Let our marriages, let, let it be a witness, God, in a world of chaos and confusion, I pray. Oh God, touch us, help us, lead us, guide us, I pray. Amen. Create in me a clean heart. Lift your hands. Sing it this morning. Create. Thank you for opening our eyes. God, remove the hardness from our hearts, I pray.
let's worship God. Let's thank God for what he's done this morning, what he's spoken to our hearts. Father, we thank you, God. We're so grateful, Lord. God, it's not by our wits, it's not by our understanding. God, but by your spirit, I pray, help us, Lord. God, that we would build homes on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this. God, I ask you, Lord, your blessing. Let it rest upon every marriage in this church. God, I bind strategies. God, the plans of the enemy. God, that work against our marriages, our families, and homes. I ask you, God, that you strengthen us as husbands and wives, Lord. God, give us a vision. Give us a focus for one another, for our spouse, Lord. Asking you, minister, help, new life resurrection power God there's always hope with you we thank you for this and we ask it in Jesus name amen our heads are bowed I'd like to ask if my brother Larry Lau would ask God's blessing as we